Okay, the first part of the afternoon session is going to be another panel. It's going to be uh, moderated by uh, Jennifer Alano here uh, from the Department of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery. And the panelists will be Dr. Scott Soltis from Radiation Oncology um, and Dr. Peter Santa Maria from Department of uh, uh, Otolaryngology. Great, thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure to meet all of you and to have this opportunity to share and learn from each other. Um, I also wanted to introduce a third panelist, um, Matt Fitzgerald, who uh, was going to represent um, audiology for us, is, couldn't be here today. So we have Melissa Tribble, who comes um, from the Department of ENT and audiology, as an audiologist. So um, in the next 55 minutes or so, we're gonna try to talk a little bit more granularly about um, what do we mean by hearing preservation and how do we measure hearing. Uh, we'll go through some cases together and um, talk about what are the effects of single-sided hearing loss and potential rehabilitative options. And then finally, spend a little bit of time on tinnitus at the end. So Melissa, um, or Dr. Tribble, uh, could you just give us a little information on how do we measure hearing and what are all these different figures that we see? What are these numbers? Um, what does word recognition mean to you and how do we weigh all that in terms of um, whether someone has good hearing or poor hearing? Um, yes, uh, so an audiogram is just a tool that we use to be able to communicate uh, the difficulty someone may have with communication. So there's kind of two major components of the audiogram. One is an assessment we do by pure tones to figure out the softest that someone can hear different tones. So that can let us know whether or not a hearing loss is present. So uh, in front of you, you see uh, two graphs, uh, one representing the right ear, the other representing the left ear. Um, for us audiologists, we like the red and blue because that helps us to tell the difference. <laughs> um, and then the circles and X's help to differentiate the two as well. Um, and as you see on the graph, you'll see some uh, values on the, I guess it will be on your left-hand side, of a very low, a low number all the way up to a high number. And ideally, what we want to see is a hearing sensitivity to be above about 20 to 25 decibels to so consider that to be hearing in the normal range. Um, the more we see it towards the bottom of the page, the more degree of hearing loss there may be. Um, hearing loss is also going to vary across different frequencies, so not all frequencies are going to be impacted the same. So as a result, not all hearing losses are going to be um, presenting the same as well. Um, additionally, with our testing, what we want to know is functionally how is the hearing loss affecting that person and how is it going to impact the recommendations we're going to make. And so additional testing we may do is word recognition testing. So if any of you have been to an audiologist, you may have been asked to say words like baseball, ice cream, airplane. Um, and then also asked to say a bunch of random uh, one-syllable words as well. And that's just helping us to, to understand what may be your speech difficulties. And then depending upon the clinic you go to, you may also be asked to do those same activities in noise. So again, that's helping us to get an idea of how is the hearing loss that we may be measuring, impacting, how you're able to communicate. We use this information to share with our otolaryngologist colleagues to be able to help with differential diagnosis, but then also to help us figure out what may be the best treatment options. So Dr. Santa Maria, can you comment a little bit about what the term hearing preservation means, both in terms of a medical literature standpoint, but also in terms of a practical standpoint? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a, it's an interesting question, and actually it's, it's evolved as the devices and the, uh, the treatments that we have for hearing have evolved. So traditionally, um, as you can see there in the color, is we divided hearing loss into kind of norm, normal, mild, moderate, all the way through to profound. Um, and the American Academy and others have classified this as what they thought would be reasonable. Um, and it's a combination, so um, just going back to what Dr. Tribble said earlier, uh, and relevant to the audience, is we look at two things. We look at kind of the pure tone average, which is the average uh, across four frequencies. So what are you hearing when you hear pure tones? And the other one is speech recognition uh, or word recognition. Um, and of course, that's done in a, a nice audiological sound booth. Um, it's done uh, with, with the, the words that she described. It's not, not usually done in noise, um, even though we do that uh, kind of testing here at Stanford. So all those things put together of what your threshold is for, for hearing pure tones, what your understanding of that is, is relevant to what we consider is and I, we've gone a kind of a, a away from using, uh, you know, service of hearing, which is kind of an older term, but we try to say what's useful hearing or worthwhile hearing, and it's a very vague term because it actually means different things to different people. 
Um, what we kind of, at a, a base level, when we look at that, if we think that we can rehabilitate that hearing with a device, such as a hearing aid or something else, then we think that's uh, useful hearing. Um, and that's what we try to aim to do with whatever we do when we talk about hearing preservation, whether it's uh, any of the treatment modalities. All right, so why don't we move on to some cases. Some of these, you'll see some um, echoes from the, the case discussions we had this morning, but it'll be interesting to hear some other perspectives, and Dr. Soltis can uh, reprise some of his thoughts as well. Um, so this first patient was a 65-year-old 60, man who came in with actually bilateral hearing loss and tinnitus. He had one episode of vertigo about eight years ago, but otherwise has very good balance, no facial nerve symptoms. Um, and he's been using hearing aids on both sides and have, has been finding them helpful. Um, this is his hearing test, and so this is actually the test we were looking at just a few slides ago. So you can see um, on the right side and the left side, he has the higher frequencies of his hearing affected more than the, the lower frequencies. So it's set up on this scale, kind of like a piano keyboard where the low tones are on uh, the left and the high frequencies or the high tones are on the right, um, and they're much lower in the higher frequencies. Um, the other important thing to look at is this word recognition or word clarity score, and he scores uh, very well on both sides, 84% in his better right ear and actually 96% on his worst left ear. So because of this asymmetry, one of the things we uh, recommend is getting an MRI, which he did. And he was found to have a small 3.5 millimeter vestibular schwannoma on the left side. Uh, Dr. Soltis, how, how would you approach this patient? <clears throat> yeah, this is uh, you know, similar to what we discussed this morning, but the options are observation uh, versus treatment. And within treatment would be radiosurgery or surgery. Um, but since this is newly diagnosed and uh, unclear how much this may be impacting his hearing, uh, observation is what it is reasonable and what I would recommend. Dr. Santa Maria, any thoughts? No, I think that's, that's great. So um, just going back to the audiogram, and I, I know this a story that often people hear. You'd say, hey, let's get an MRI, knowing, and you'd probably say, look, we're not, most likely not going to see an acoustic room. We're going to check for it anyway, but that we found one. Um, but, uh, you know, this guy's a uh, 65-year-old. Um, we don't know what the rest of uh, him is like, so we'd like to know what his, the rest of his medical history is, because I think that plays in a role. Um, uh, sometimes you get some very um, energetic and he very healthy 65-year-olds, and, and the opposite is true. So that all comes into play with how you might counsel them towards uh, treating them. But unfortunately, he's got a, he's got a tiny uh, acoustic neuroma there. Would your recommendations change for either of you if the patient was 25 instead of 65? Uh, yes. So, you know, if, if the patient's young um, and they have a small tumour, um, you know, the, the likelihood at some point in their life uh, their, their tumour may grow. And so we'd have a, a, the conversation may lean towards, well, should we treat this uh, rather than uh, watch and wait, as opposed to, the, the, in this case, we'd like more likely to watch and wait. Dr. Soltis, any thoughts if it were a much younger patient? Um, <clears throat> sure, at some point I would be more likely to recommend treatment, but not at first diagnosis, you know, regardless of age, essentially. If at, at certain age level, then uh, I would send them for genetic testing because mm -hmm. you're concerned about neurofibromatosis. All right, let's move on to our second patient. So this is an 80-year-old woman who came in with right hearing loss um, that had been slowly progressive over several years. She also had been developing some disequilibrium or some imbalance, mild, when she was walking. Um, she had right-sided tinnitus, uh, but no facial nerve symptoms. And here's her audiogram. Um, Dr. Tribble, do you mind walking us through what, what the audiogram is showing? Yeah, so on this audiogram, we're seeing asymmetry in the hearing loss. So on the right side, it's looking like a mild to sloping to profound uh, hearing loss. And uh, whereas on the left side, it's a kind of low frequency rising to normal before sloping to a severe hearing loss in the high frequencies. Um, probably the big thing to make a, a note of is not just the discrepancy in the pure tones, but also in the word recognition score. Um, given the degree of hearing loss on the right side, um, I would say that's kind of borderline concerning a word recognition score. Um, so that's probably what's kind of sh jumping out at me a little bit more um, as far as what I would want to recommend beyond having a consultation with an otolaryngologist as far as an uh, amplification option. 
All right, so she too got an MRI, surprise, surprise, and she was found to have a one in, uh, about a one and a half centimeter right <coughs> vestibular schwannoma. Um, both Dr. Soltis and Dr. Santamira, how, how would you approach this patient? Is it any different than the last? Um, so options are still the same. Again, if newly diagnosed, uh, and particularly in an 80 year old, uh, I would uh, just get a new scan in six months. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I think uh, the thing to realise, and, and with the, the hearing there, is if, if we went, go back and think for the uh, people in the audience that couldn't see her, word recognition was around 64%. And so it's already on the verge of, of struggling with hearing in that ear. Um, and I'd also have a long uh, counselling talk with this lady, and we talk about the most likely thing that's going to happen to her hearing is she's going to lose hearing or functional hearing in that ear. And I'd prepare her for that, so talk to her about um, hearing rehabilitation um, as appropriate in either ear. So it turns out she had had an earlier MRI several years ago uh, for something else, and at the time they hadn't noticed any uh, issues in the internal auditory canal or affecting the hearing imbalanced nerve. But with the uh, benefit of retrospectacles, uh, we did see that her acoustic at the time was considerably smaller. So given this, that it looks like it's a growing tumor, how would you proceed? <clears throat> so at this point, that's essentially, even though in retrospect this was observed, we know that this is growing, uh, I would uh, lean towards treatment depending on how robust of an 80-year-old she is. If it's like a, a lot of the 80-year-olds the we see around here, then uh, their expected you know, survival would be decades still, uh, and I would recommend treatment. Uh, but it's all, we need more information about how uh, this uh, patient looks. Dr. Santa Maria? Yeah, and I think what you're getting to is, I mean, that's, yeah, exactly, depending on if it's a, a great 80 year old or a not so great 80 year old, um, it can go either way. But generally, if they're growing, they're likely to continue to grow, so you, you, you'd counsel for that. Um, and you'd have to start to think ahead of what that might mean, whether it's a short period of continued observation or, or to treat it, but I'd be more inclined to treat it if she was open to that and uh, she had no other health concerns. And by treat it, which treatment mod modality would you recommend? Uh, yeah, so this would be um, a, a good one for uh, either stereotactic radiation um, or surgery. Um, given that she has, uh, it, would, it would be talking to her about her hearing, if she really enjoyed hearing in, in that ear, um, I don't think that surgery um, would have a good result for her hearing on this, on this side. Um, so if, if she was adamant that surgery was her preferred treatment option, I'd counsel her that she'd unlikely be able to save hearing in this, in this tumour. Um, and then the counselling would go towards st stereotactic radiation. Um, but um, both, are, both are good treat modalities, but probably erring towards radiation. And if she were, say, 45 instead of 80? Yeah, and the same goes with my, uh, uh, I guess, my counselling earlier. Um, generally younger patients, I, I, I recommend surgery um, uh, more often, and the, the opposite is true with older patients. All right, let's move on to our third case. So this is a 55-year-old woman who came in with left hearing loss for the past two to three years. Um, she also had some mild imbalance and just a few episodes of more severe spinning vertigo. Um, unlike the other patients, she did start to have some facial numbness, which for her only affected the lip. Um, and this is her audiogram. Um, and so this time, the right and the left sides aren't separated, but you can see the red is the right side, um, the blue is the left side. And so on the red, all the marks are above 25, so we consider that normal hearing. And on the left, in the highest frequencies, um, the, the blue or the X's dip, and so she has a mild high frequency sensory neural hearing loss. Her word clarity or her word recognition is still very good on both sides, 100% and 92%. Um, she, unsurprisingly, as the other cases, got an MRI, and uh, she was actually found to have a three and a half centimeter vestibular schwannoma. Um, but she has great hearing, surprisingly. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is, this is a tumor and it's big. You can see it there. Um, for those that aren't used to looking at MRIs, it's pushing against the brain stem. Um, and so, you know, in the, 
in the future, this is going to be potentially life-threatening if, um, if we leave it be and it continues to grow. Um, and when you have a younger person that has a large tumour, even though you don't know the growth rate, um, I would err on the side of um, surgery in this case. Um, and unfortunately for her, she has great hearing. Um, and we'd have that discussion. Um, there is two ways to get at this. One is through the ear and one is behind the ear. The approach that we call the retrosigmoid approach. But in this size tumour, um, the likelihood of saving hearing is small, with, even with the retrosigmoid approach. So we would have a, a real um, deep conversation about that and, and talk about um, uh, the approach of surgery, um, what that means in terms of side effects. Um, but I would counsel her towards surgery um, for a tumour that's big in a young person. Dr. Soltis, any different thoughts? Um, <clears throat> so I would not recommend observations, so either surgery or radiosurgery, but this candidate uh, this patient is a candidate for radiosurgery. As I mentioned this morning, uh, you know, the absolute indications for surgery would be if you don't know what the pathology is or you're concerned it's not a benign tumor or if they're having symptomatic mass effect. She certainly has mass effect, but she's not that symptomatic. So uh, one, she has time to decide what to do and consult with you know, uh, multiple physicians. Uh, but we do and have, you know, treated uh, tumors this large with radiosurgery. Uh, the tumor control outcomes are less. Uh, some of the toxicities may be less. It just, it's a bigger tumor, but that's still an option for her. Dr. Chibble, do you have any thoughts for this patient? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, just kind of a side note, since it's obvious that this was something that would be treated surgically, um, I just wanted to bring up sometimes the audiogram. It's something that we do in quiet, and it's in like the perfect scenario, so I would be interested in just her chief complaints overall, whether or not she's finding that she is having difficulty in certain environments, or if she is having any impact that doesn't show up on the audiogram. Um, just because those could also be signs that, you know, for an audiologist that may prompt that. Sometimes when we see hearing loss like, losses like that, I specialize in pediatric audiology, so I may see a loss like that, and the first thing that jumps to mind would not be acoustic neuroma, to be honest with you. Um, however, I think when you are able to listen to what the patient's descriptions of their symptoms are and everything else, that helps with being able to put them in the right direction of who can treat the problem. So I just wanted to add that in there. So are there other ways people test the hearing um, with background noise or other? Yes, yes. So um, what we may do, especially if someone is complaining of having difficulty in background noise, is possibly, um, is possibly uh, doing testing in background noise. So either doing a speech test with multi-talker babble noise, so it sounds like if you're in a restaurant and people are talking around you, listening to words and being able to repeat it in that scenario. Um, another test we may do is actually something called rollover, where we present the speech much louder just to see if there's any degradation in how well you understand speech too, because sometimes that can also be um, a cue of, of difficulty as well. I, before you, I had a question about uh, audiograms, and uh, patients are often asked, so how do you, what, what's the pure tone average? How do you uh, calculate that? So um, our pure tone average, um, we would look at between 500 hertz and 2,000 hertz. Um, so we look at that for each and then divide it by the three frequencies. Um, and then also what we're looking at is with that pure tone average that it matches up with our speech recognition threshold. So when I was talking about the speech words before, the baseball, airplane, uh, ice cream, those words we would expect to match up with your pure tone average. So that's why we're running that test, to make sure there isn't any significant discrepancy between the two. And is pure tone average standardized amongst uh, different audiograms? Yes, yes, it should be. Dr. Santa Maria, earlier you had mentioned um, whether or not a hearing, uh, hearing is useful by whether or not it's aidable. Can you expand a little bit more on that? Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess there's two things. There's one is if you, can, uh, if you amplify the sounds, uh, can you amplify it effectively without feedback? Um, and that goes to what the pure tones is. The other one, and it's relevant to the uh, patients with acoustic neuroma, is sometimes if you aid the ear, you, um, you provide it louder, it actually sounds more scrambled up. Um, so it's called DB rollover, so if you elevate the sound, it actually sounds more worse. So uh, you might have an ear that looks good uh, with thresholds, but you actually, as you raise the, the volume, um, the, the coding is actually worse. Um, and so you have to both look at um, the pure tones, the word recognition, and the aidable, or the, uh, the, the word recognition as the sound gets louder. 
All right, so uh, let's move on to you know, what are some effects of having single-sided hearing loss and what can we do about it? Um, Dr. Tribble, what are, other than you know, not having sound input from one side, what can you say about the effects of single-sided hearing loss? Um, so as alluded to on the slide, one of the biggest uh, reports of difficulty is with sound localization. So being, in, uh, sorry, um, being uneven with how um, sound, uh, being uneven with how you're hearing is going to affect your ability to have the cues that let you know where sound is coming from. Uh, the other major complaint is uh, hearing and background noise. So when you lose that ability to hear as well from one ear, then you're more likely to struggle in background noise. Um, I think something that is not readily discussed as much, um, but is also present, and I think getting more attention is just the, um, uh, is just the, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking out, is um, the uh, amount of effort, listening effort, that is going into play. So sometimes so we focus on these big things like localization and hearing and noise, but another effect of single-sided hearing loss is just putting more effort into listening, more fatigue at the end of the day. There may be um, anxiety that you may have that's coming up because you're facing a situation that's harder to hear. So those are more subtle things that, that um, people with uh, experiencing single-sided hearing loss may experience. So there are a number of solutions for single-sided hearing loss, both non-surgical and surgical. Um, Dr. Triple, can you just tell us a little bit more about the non-surgical options? Um, yes, so the most um, common option is going to be a hearing aid or an air conduction hearing aid. Um, they come in lots of different styles, whether it goes completely in the ear or something that goes behind the ear. Um, uh, as uh, Dr. Santa Maria, to, Dr. Santa Maria was speaking to, um, sometimes when there isn't that residual hearing that we can uh, benefit from that type of hearing aid, then we may talk about a bone conduction device um, that is sometimes a non-surgical option, either worn on a, a, a type of headband. Uh, now there's a newer option that uses a sticker, um, where the device attaches to a sticker. Um, and then there's also uh, contralateral uh, routing signal um, devices or cross devices. And so with those, you're actually wearing devices on both ears. Um, on the impaired ear, you're wearing a receiver. And on the, sorry, on the impaired ear, you're wearing a transmitter. On the better hearing ear, you're wearing a receiver. And it, second time, um, and it routes the signal over to that better hearing ear um, so that you are able to pick up and perceive sounds that are happening on the impaired side. Dr. Santa Maria, when do you recommend cross-hearing devices or bi-cross-hearing devices? Uh, yeah, I think the first, uh, the, the taking a step back, I think um, for people in the audience to realize, and it's kind of changed, especially um, having talked at acoustic neuromyth associations in the past, is that there is an overwhelming number of things that we can do for hearing loss um, now that we couldn't do five or even 10 years ago. Um, and I think that should be encouraging. Um, and so. When we're usually faced with a patient with single-sided hearing loss for this or other reasons, um, I usually give them the whole, um, the whole chat, which includes uh, the non-surgical approaches as well as the surgical approaches. And I think um, if you even go to the, 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 the slide before, uh, we, we have a, a lifestyle discussion. So if, uh, if you're uh, older and you're uh, very solitary, maybe you hang around with your partner, um, then maybe uh, a cross-hearing aid or some people opt for no, for, for no uh, treatment. But if uh, we see a lot of executives in the Bay Area here, if you're uh, struggling with m multi speakers around a conference table, then they may be uh, more inclined to pursue um, surgical options. Nothing, I think the other thing to realize is that nothing will give you what you were born with. Um, so it's never going to be uh, as good as you were born with. But it can be, make the situation um, uh, and the, uh, I guess the problems with sound localization or hearing a noise better. Um, and so I think a good way to think about it is if you're considering uh, treating your single-sided deafness is that um, you can try a lot of these things before you buy. So a lot of the uh, cross-hearing aids and similar uh, devices uh, don't really have any side effects, so why not try it? Uh, the bone conduction hearing aids, you can wear headbands and get a, get a sense of what that sensation feels like. Of course, the implants, like the cochlear implants, you cannot try um, before you buy. You have to put it in and see what it's like. So, um, but there is a, a good way that you can get an idea of what, what it might be if you were to, to use it. Dr. Tribble, can you, just so that we're all on the same page, explain a little bit more about what is a bone conduction device? What does that even mean? How does it work? Okay, yeah. So um, with bone conduction, what you're doing is actually using the skull to help with transmitting the sound. So there's two ways that sound can be transmitted. One is by air. So right now, 
the air is what's helping my voice to transmit. Uh, the other is through another surface. Um, so bone conduction allows for you to um, have an amplification device that's actually vibrating, and by vibrating the skull, it's actually taking advantage of the better hearing ear in the contralateral or the opposite cochlea. And so that device allows for us to take advantage of the good hearing um, and then allows for that perception to happen on the side that's impaired. Dr. Santaria, can you tell us more about the surgical options for uh, single-sided hearing loss? Hey, so I think we've got them displayed there um, in a nutshell. So there's the bone uh, conduction hearing aids that are on the left that, um, as Dr. Tribble described, they work through conducting through the bone. And I think that was discovered by um, someone uh, realizing that you could hear something through their teeth. Um, and those of you that go to the dentist will kind of hear the drill in the ear will kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, so they are all different types of ways of um, fixing something into the bone. So there's the, um, we have an, what we call an abutment, which is like a big screw um, that's uh, fixed into the skull on one side. They can be transcutaneous or percutaneous. They can go through the skin or they can be completely hidden under the skin. Um, we've, there's a newer device there, um, the bone bridge, which is um, completely under the skin and has a, um, a magnetic receiver on the outside. They're all ways of stimulating the opposite ear, the better ear, through the, through the side that doesn't hear. Um, the uh, cochlear implant um, is a really brilliant device, and uh, I guess as a specialty, we have a lot of experience in this in, in other indications. Um, but it essentially converts acoustic sound into electrical sound. So you can see there is a thin wire, we call that an, an electrode array, and on there is little electrodes that we place into the inner ear. And the thought there is that when you have a hearing loss, that you can stimulate the nerve cell bodies of the inner ear um, to listen to sounds, and that electricity is interpreted by the brain as sound. So you can imagine that uh, there's a lot of uh, fancy um, compression and, and, uh, and, and banding that happens with, with the sounds. So it doesn't sound normal, but it can actually be uh, something that can uh, return uh, some semblance of sound in that ear. Um, and uh, you know, we have uh, a, a large experience in, um, in implantation and, and the results are excellent, but uh, they're definitely not uh, for everyone. And, and I think the patients with single-sided uh, side deafness need to be chosen carefully. In particular, for patients with acoustic neuromas, um, they often need multiple MRIs over the next uh, foreseeable future. So are some patients who have hearing implants still candidates? Um, can they still get MRIs even if they get a hearing implant? Uh, they, all, uh, they all are now um, MRI compatible. Um, I guess, uh, there's a, they are rated to different uh, I guess strengths of MRIs. So MRI strength is related in Tesla. So. Uh, most of them are rated uh, for the most common MRIs at the moment. Um, before that, the ones that are not MRI compatible, um, sometimes you need to remove the magnet to have an MRI. Sometimes uh, you just need to bandage the head, they're, they're a little bit different. So there are um, some nuances there. You can see the smaller ones, I guess the top right MRI uh, with a bone conduction hearing aid, there's not much of a shadow cast there. Uh, but the relevant thing there is if, if patients are going to have serial MRIs and, and require uh, monitoring of something on that side, um, some of the implants can uh, uh, create quite a big shadow. And so you have to think about what that shadow means to the patient. Um, if you're following a, a small tumor and not so worried about it, it might not mean much. But if, if you're worried and concerned that there may be something you, you're missing by underneath that shadow, then you, you may not uh, be suitable for a cochlear implant on that side. Dr. Solt, uh, we talked about it. Dr. Solt, is, do hearing implants affect your treatment approach or radiation therapy options? Um, well, largely no other than if, so this would, this would imply that someone has a hearing implant prior to uh, a tumor growing and needed treatment. Uh, as long as the uh, MRI is one, both shows the tumor, but two, I trust the spatial accuracy of that, uh, then we can treat the patient. Uh, so we would work with uh, the, the otolaryngologist, we work with the implant uh, manufacturer about uh, what, and we work with radiology to ensure that what we're seeing is accurate. Um, the other consideration is, would the radiation itself affect the, uh, the implant? Uh, for instance, if you have a pacemaker, 
Uh, we're very careful to avoid you know, radiation beams going through the pacemaker when we're treating around the thorax. So we would have a similar discussion with uh, the device company because uh, every company is a little bit different. Dr. Sanamir, are there times when, you know, do you wait for tumors to demonstrate stability or say after someone has re uh, surgery or has, has had radiation in the past, when do you think about um, hearing, surgical hearing implants versus when do you recommend um, non-surgical options? I, th I think if, uh, if a patient's uh, usually the, not on the first, uh, not on the first visit, and I think, uh, like Dr. Soltis is, is, was alluding to, you like to kind of see what path that, that patient and that tumour is going, um, whether or not you're going to need to have uh, uh, radiation or surgery um, or something else. Um, I think you don't want to jump in and, and put an implant in there in the, in the immediate setting. Um, uh, but saying that, there is a very small um, uh, case series, um, and it's, I guess it's a growing... Um, area for research um, is that there are patients that we do do simultaneous surgery to remove the tumor and put in a, a, a cochlear implant in the ear. Um, and that's, you know, that really is in the small numbers around the world, but we're getting uh, good results with that. And I think we'll learn more about that in the future. So it's still an evolving, uh, evolving uh, I guess, uh, treatment option for patients. Um, I think uh, it really gets back to what the patient's uh, social situations and lifestyle is like, what their expectations are. Um, in single-sided deafness in general, if patients have severely uh, debil debilitating tinnitus, uh, then uh, the cochlear implant is a potentially good option for that with single-sided deafness. Um, and, and also to follow on with what Dr. Saltis was saying, uh, with its effect on radiation, um, you know, it, it affects your monitoring of the tumor, um, and it, you know, there are some coordination and some ha hassles involved with that, um, and certainly um, uh, there are circumstances where we've had to remove the magnet um, uh, for, uh, for, for follow-up imaging. Um, so all those things have to be taken uh, together, so it's, it's not a simple uh, discussion, but uh, I guess it's something that we should think about as an option. All right, so this brings us to our fourth case. So this is a 51-year-old woman um, who came in with right uh, profound hearing loss that happened suddenly 15 years ago. Um, and then she had a few uh, minutes of left-sided hearing loss, so on her good side, um, that went away completely for a few minutes and then spontaneously recovered, thankfully. And so this is her hearing test. You can see the right side is profound and the left side is actually quite good with only a slight dip in the lowest frequencies. Um, her MRI ended up showing a small vestibular schwannoma on her only hearing ear. So we had a similar case this morning. Um, I think, Dr. Soltis, you said you would most likely observe in the beginning, but you'd have a discussion with the patient, is that right, or? Yeah, <clears throat> same as, this, is this patient also a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a lawyer this time, but. <laughs> yeah. So we had the same case on the right side in the lawyer this morning, but uh, yes, yeah, similar, uh, since the hearing came back, the hearing's normal, uh, it's uh, uh, controversial, but I would observe this patient. Dr. Santa Maria, any other thoughts? Uh, that's definitely an option. Um, this is not an easy case, and that's why you're bringing it up. Um, and so uh, we would we'd think ahead, I guess, into the future of what this patient's hearing condition would likely be. Um, and we're going to have an issue with the hearing on the left. So I'd look uh, very quickly at trying to uh, think about rehabilitating the right side. And this is a case where I would have a discussion about a potential cochlear implant in the right while we figure out what's going on in the left and whether that's observing or pre-treating or, or, or doing whatever in that ear. Yeah, so this patient ended up having a cochlear implant, as you said, on the right side, so on the, the side that doesn't have the schwannoma. Um, and here you can see her follow-up MRIs to follow that small four millimeter schwannoma. And you can see that there is a lot of image artifact from the implant side. You, we can't really see the, the inner ear uh, without significant distortion. On this, on this right side, um, but on her left side with the schwannoma on the side opposite the cochlear implant, we can still see it very well despite all the image artifact on the other side. Um, so this patient is doing uh, fairly well. She's now three years out from her cochlear implant, about four years out from following that schwannoma, and, and thankfully it's been stable. Um, let's move on to tinnitus. Now, tinnitus is a tricky thing, and sometimes it can be difficult to get some answers. 
Um, so I'd, I'd like to ask the panel a, a number of different questions. Um, what is tinnitus, first of all? Is it how common is it? Um, what causes it, and how do we treat it? And in playing into vestibular schwannoma, does the presence or absence of tinnitus affect your treatment strategy? Um, how can we expect tinnitus to respond? Um, so Dr. Tribble, let's start with you. Can you tackle um, the first couple of questions? What is tinnitus? How common is it? And what causes it? Yeah, I can try. I have all the answers. Um, <laughs> So uh, basically tinnitus is just the perception of sound without there being an external stimulus. Um, as far as how common it is, um, I think some of that may just depend on report, but it does affect, gosh, I forget, I'm forgetting the statistics off the top of my head, so I apologize. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, but I would say it's regularly common because I think it's a common question. If you ask someone if they've ever heard ringing in their ears, they will say that they hear it occasionally. Um, as far as the number of people who are impaired by it, um, that's m much lesser, but does affect a great number of people. Um, as far as the causes, there's variable causes. Um, most times tinnitus is attached to um, hearing loss specifically, so, um, but we can also see it as um, uh, in a, in a, occurring because of uh, medication. Um, it could be occurring because of trauma to the ear, whether that be a physical trauma to the ear or trauma because of noise exposure. Um, sometimes it does happen for unknown reasons. So there is plentiful the causes, but I would say that most times uh, it is related to a, a hearing loss being present. Dr. Santa Maria, any thoughts on that? And can you also comment about how we treat tinnitus? Yes, yeah, so um, I, th I think I like the, the analogy that I often tell uh, patients is it is very common um, and there was a, a study that you probably only get away with Dutch university students but they did it to Dutch university students where they put them into sound uh, uh, proof uh, rooms and, and sound deprived them and 80-90% to of them experienced tinnitus within an hour and these were normal hearing individuals so you can sound deprive people and get them to report tinnitus. Uh, it's kind of like a natural phenomenon. We don't know why that is. It could be from the ear or the nerve or the brain. It's pretty, it's pretty vague as to where it, it actually generated from. Um, but I think the important thing to realize is that tinnitus is normal for most people. But what is not normal is abnormally obtrusive tinnitus or uh, I guess the severity of tinnitus. And that's where uh, something that we talk about treating. Um, tinnitus, uh, I I'm actually try to encourage patients that I see with tinnitus um, in that, uh, you know, there is no cure for tinnitus. If there was, I, I would probably sail, be sailing somewhere rather than sitting here. But um, there is a lot of things that we can do about uh, tinnitus um, and we can make tinnitus better. So if you're reporting sort of tinnitus on a scale of 10 up to seven or eight, we can often do things that can get it down to patient, you know, around about three or four. And that could be a range of things. So the first uh, thing recommended by the American Academy um, of Otolaryngology is to rehabilitate hearing loss. So um, you know, I, I send uh, patients to Dr. Tribble um, and uh, she would hopefully fit them with a hearing device or a hearing aid that would um, amplify sound. Um, and that could uh, raise the external sound and make the internal sound relatively less. Um, there are other things that can be done in terms of masking and they can be home masking um, devices. So, um, this works on my children to help them go to sleep, but uh, white noise therapy. Um, so uh, most um, uh, patients kind of know what their t tinnitus is like. You can actually go to centres and have them pitch matched. I had one patient come and say that his tinnitus was uh, the same sound as Tibetan gongs, so he plays Tibetan gongs to himself every night. Um, but uh, if you can find a, a match uh, 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 according to the pitch, um, masking is shown to be really successful. You can go one step up and actually get uh, masking uh, devices and, and purchase them. They kind of look like a hearing aid. And you can also get hearing aids that have fitted masking into them, either pink or white noise, that can alleviate tinnitus. There are rare cases where there is some uh, drug therapies that can help, but I would not put that uh, anywhere near the top of my list. Um, and occasionally, um, along with that, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy or psychological approaches. And I think if you look at the general health of patients, um, if you can get the general health better, better, if you look at the rest of their body, the rest of their comorbidities, um, and you address the health of the patient as well, well as the psychological um, aspect of that, tinnitus can actually be uh, managed, uh, but not necessarily cured. 
Dr. Schill? If there, there's anyone here that's experiencing tinnitus, there is um, the IDA Institute, IDA Institute, if you haven't heard of it. Um, it's a website, and they offer, um, it's for hearing loss in general, but they also have uh, different tools on there. Um, some of the tools that are on there can be helpful with working with your audiologist or therapist as far as pre-post treatment um, or just being able to give a better measurement of the what you're experiencing. Um, and then they also have resources for hearing loss as well. Um, but those things can be really helpful as far as the coping um, and management as well um, with, with having the tinnitus um, and the expectation. So a lot of it is really focused on creating a community and making sure you have family, friends, and someone who can kind of help work with you through that. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Dr. Soltis, does having tinnitus affect um, your treatment recommendations at all? Um, in short, no. Uh, I mean, if they're candidates for any option, then they, they remain candidates regarded, regardless of their tinnitus. Uh, I will add, you know, tinnitus is a patient-reported outcome. It's, it's harder to test, and it's not like an audiogram where we can put a number to it necessarily. Uh, and the, the Acoustic Neuroma Association does have the patient questionnaires, and there's a wealth of good data uh, in there about all of the patients with acoustic neuromas that have uh, answered that questionnaire. And you can track uh, tinnitus before and after treatment and, and at certain periods of time. So if you, whenever that next questionnaire comes out, uh, please you know, fill that out so all of us have more information. Thank you for mentioning that, because this is actually a, <laughs> a summary of um, a recent survey of the Acoustic Neuroma Association of patients who had different treatment modalities and how severe their tinnitus was. So this is a scale, the tinnitus functional index that goes from zero um, up to 100, where the lower the score um, reflects a um, reflects that tinnitus is less of a problem in their life. And you can see that um, between all of the different treatment modalities, when you look um, five five, ten years after treatment, um, tinnitus levels are about the same. And so generally, it seems that most of us don't tend to um, take the presence or absence of tinnitus into um, much of our medical decision making in terms of tumors. Dr. Santa Maria, did you have any other thoughts? Or what do you tell patients about their tinnitus, um, what to expect after they get treatment? Uh, I tell them the most likely thing is it's not going to change um, after treatment. Um, and I think the, the research has shown that. there is. Um, uh, research that also shows that sometimes it can improve and unfortunately in a small proportion it can get worse. Um, so I usually uh, tack along with that the previous discussion that we had and talking about there is lots of things that we can do to improve tinnitus. Um, we can rehabilitate hearing that can make it manageable if it does happen to get worse. Um, so um, unfortunately, uh, like Dr. Soltis, it usually doesn't come into play with the discussion. There's so many other factors that come into um, uh, management options. Um, yeah, but just to, I guess, highlight the, the role, the emerging role of cochlear implants with patients with tinnitus, um, and that, that probably has a probably, uh, it's going to emerge even more in the next five to 10 years. So I have one last case, another challenging one, where uh, the patient is a 58-year-old woman who had right-sided hearing loss since uh, childhood, and on the left side had a slowly progressive hearing loss for a year. Um, Dr. Santa Maria, in terms of this patient compared to the other patient we had who had unilateral hearing loss for just 15 years, um, having had it since childhood, does that change how you approach the patient at all? Uh, it does, uh, only in that the, the expectations for, uh, I'm assuming the next slide might show she has an implant on the left, uh, sorry, a, a recusant neuroma on the left. <laughs> Uh, she has an acoustic neuron, okay. her better just, hearing <laughs> ear, yep. <laughs> so obviously I'd get an MRI as we did there and we'd find out if she's a, unfortunately an acoustic neuron hit. And this is devastating for her um, because not only is it her only earring, hearing ear, um, but it's likely the only hear, uh, ear that's likely to be, uh, to, to be hearing. So it, we'd have that discussion around expectations. So um, this goes back to another discussion about cochlear implants is that if you've heard sound in that ear, then you do better um, uh, from a cochlear implant point of view. If you've learned to talk, uh, you also do better um, uh, if you've lost your hearing after you've learned to talk. Assuming in this case, she lost the uh, 
uh, hearing in that ear before she learned to talk. Um, and so that ear has probably never heard sounds. So the likelihood that uh, she's going to get uh, the same, um, I guess, uh, outcomes as the previous patient is a lot less. So, but it's, it's still, uh, I would still, uh, we would have a discussion. We have a really good multidisciplinary implant um, team uh, at Stanford. We would talk about a case amongst my colleagues, um, the implant audiologist, uh, social worker, making sure that her expectations are aligned. Uh, but then we'd very likely uh, look at implanting that right, that right ear. Yeah, so this patient did get an implant on the right ear, um, but unfortunately didn't get much benefit from it because of her childhood hearing loss. Um, what would you recommend for the tumor at this point? So we have a discussion about the treatment options, um, and given this it hasn't demonstrated growth yet, and she has what uh, looks like useful hearing on that ear, um, uh, that would be a discussion to uh, whether or not we uh, continue uh, observing it, or we bite the bullet and try to um, preserve hearing in some way. Dr. Soltis? <clears throat> yeah, I agree. If this is just the first MRI, I would uh, get a new one. I would not uh, upfront treat it right now. Um, this patient ended up uh, getting radiation um, at some point later on, and her hearing on the left side unfortunately did decline, um, but she was able to get an implant on that left side eventually after her stereotactic radiation and um, does have some benefit from it several years out. Um, so anyway, at this point, um, I'd like to open up the floor. If any of you have any questions for our panelists, uh, please come up. Yeah, the question was, um, in your experience, you had a test of a bone conduction hearing aid and your tinnitus went up. Is that normal? Uh, it, I'm not sure if it's normal, but I, I usually don't recommend bone conduction hearing aids as a therapy for, for tinnitus, per se. They're not that good um, at managing tinnitus in that ear. Well, I wasn't managing tinnitus. I have no ear attack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and the tinnitus went up in the, the acoustic aroma ear? Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised by that. I probably would think that it would make no difference to the tinnitus, either positively or negative, in, in, your, in that ear. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that. Um, however, uh, I think if you had mentioned that to me, I probably would tr see if there would be any reprogramming that would be uh, helpful. Um, only because uh, sometimes there is some testing that you can do with the bone conduction device just to make sure it's set up appropriately, um, to make sure that there's no feedback um, that's being presented, and also just to make sure the settings are appropriate as well. So that would be something that I would consider doing if, if you were reporting that. Up here in the front. Thank you. Um, if the tinnitus, the quality of it keeps changing, like sometimes it's a screaming mosquito and sometimes it's like Rice Krispies crackling, and does, does that mean anything, that, it, that the nature of the sound changes, or is that typical, atypical? I'll go to you first, lady. Uh, yeah, so um, it's, I think the, question, the answer is um, it's, tinnitus can be completely variable. I don't think any particular sound in terms of pitch um, means that much. I think uh, if we're talking about acoustic neuroma in particular, um, I think generally people's tinnitus is reflected in the hearing loss. Um, and usually it's, it tends to be higher pitched and constant. But sometimes patients describe crackling or all sorts of weird things, like I said, Tibetan gongs before. Um, and we don't know really why. Um, and it's the variability of it. Exactly, yeah. And uh, sometimes uh, the variation can be uh, something that's stimulating. So people have some caffeine or some alcohol that might change the pitch or they might be staring at a, a computer screen for a long time and, and getting mentally fatigued and it might change. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know the answer Thank really you. to that. Take one more question. In the back over there? Or, oh, sorry. Thank you. 
I know it went away. I mean, it, what's any updates on it? <laughs> Yeah, so the sound bite, the question was about the sound bites. The sound bite was a fantastic device that is kind of like a, a clip on bone conduction device um, to your back molar teeth, and that provided um, uh, bone conduction to the ear. It meant that you didn't need an operation. Uh, the problem was is that you didn't need an operation, so they lost reimbursement for it, um, and it turned that it was classed as a hearing aid and was thought as a hearing aid in terms of the government. So because it didn't involve surgery, they lost reimbursement and the company um, uh, lost money and, and is now not trading. It doesn't look like it's coming back in the near future, unfortunately. Is there a question up in the front? Um, would you recommend that they have serial audiograms and how frequently to maybe to help monitor between scans if there's any progression um, or to catch hearing loss earlier for some reason? I think for me, but it just, again, I mostly specialize in, in people under 21. Uh, monitoring is just is the name of the game for us. So for me, that would be at least um, a monitoring, at least annually. Um, and then also informing families that if they notice something sooner or if they notice a significant change to call in so that we can help to address that. But I would definitely say monitoring is helpful. And I'll, I'll add to that. Uh, I mean, this is, I guess the question is outside of MRIs, is the hearing, uh, is monitoring hearing useful? Uh, and I sort of, if, if you don't want to know the answer, don't ask the question. So um, if, if patients are struggling with hearing, I say get a hearing, hearing test, especially if there's been a change. And that's when I like to know the, what the audiogram is. If the patients are doing fine and they're not, not struggling with their hearing or not, no change in hearing, then I say don't get a hearing test. Um, so I don't like to pre, I guess, see what's going on. And of course, it comes with a caveat that you should protect your hearing, and especially those with uh, one-sided hearing loss. You've got to do everything you can to look after that good hearing aid. Uh, don't go on those ride-on lawnmowers, wear hearing protection, don't listen to heavy metal music anymore, all that sort of thing. And you've got to be, got to be very gentle with that ear. So um, I, I don't screen with audi audiograms. Yeah, one thing on that note, one thing that came up at our table at the lunch hour was, um, you know, there's apps on the phone that can measure how loud things are. So if the sound in the area that you, you are is over 90 decibels, you should either move further away or, or put in an earplug. Or even if you're just, you know, the sirens are going by on the street as you're walking, you can plug your, your good hearing ear um, just to extra protect that single side. I think there's two parts of that. One is the first bit is tinnitus mapping. So did you want to did you want to cover well, that? Well, we do tinnitus matching, so being able to kind of have the patient give us feedback about that and then during the testing matching to the frequency where they're having it, that can help with determining the type of masker that's needed and in some of the hearing devices that provide sound therapy that'll also assist with providing the proper uh, frequency and tone that will help to alleviate and kind of uh, phase out the, the perceived tinnitus. And the second part of the question was uh, sort of looking at brainwaves and tinnitus. I don't think there's anything reliably uh, good that's showing where it's coming from. It's still a bit of a mystery, unfortunately. I think maybe we have time for one more. Take the last one. Uh, so uh, in my tinnitus situation, I've got two sounds that, that go on. I'm sure that's pretty common. But a third one that happens is a reaction to a sound. It's a one-time reaction to a sound that's somewhere in the distance. And it feels like there's a slight delay between hearing the sound and then the sound in the ear. Is that, is that pretty common? And this is in a, your, an ear with a tumor in it? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I've, I've heard of that before, uh, but it's, it's not common at all, and I can't explain why <laughs> it has that at all, just like I can't explain why most tinnitus occurs. All right, well, thank you to our panelists. Thank you all for your participation as well. Great questions. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.